And of course, Bodhicitta is the umbrella for which everything else we do in any class, any practice. Uh, hopefully, uh, as your practice develops, it's the cornerstone for everything you do in life regarding every thought, speech, action, sleep, meal. Uh, it all comes down to this one thing, Bodhicitta. You've learned nothing else in the next six years. This is it. Bring that into your life. We'll talk more about that tonight as well. Without that, everything else is irrelevant. Okay, so one more time. Bodhicitta is precious. May it arise in whom it has not arisen. Once arisen, may it ever grow and flourish. Oh, one last one. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, and please say your name so we all know. Yeah. Yeah. Marvin from Sarasota, Florida. <laughs> okay. Yes. Uh, so the definition of compassion in Buddhism. Uh, this is Marvin's question from Sarasota. What is our definition? Because everyone has, you know, many people have def different definitions. But we have one that we use. Um, but first, let me give you where it comes from. Um, the Sanskrit is karuna. Please repeat. Karuna. It's K-A-R-U-N-A -A in Sanskrit, karuna. And in Tibetan, for you Tibetophiles, uh, please repeat. Ning. <laughs> Je. Uh, Ning, N-Y-I-N-G, means heart. And je, uh, je, -e, ning je, uh, it means Lord in Tibetan, which is an honorific. We don't mean God by that term, just an honorific. So um, the Tibetan captures it well. Uh, when the King Songsen Gampo uh, in the seventh century invited the Sanskrit, uh, 25 Sanskrit panditas to come and, and literally make, they had no written language in Tibet. And, um, you have this very educated guy who has all these Tibetan uh, nomads, and they're really, really Tibetans have a very bad reputation at this time. And he's trying to um, get Tibetans to, to learn uh, Dharma. And like, ha that's a, it's quite the undertaking. So you have these 25 Indian panditas or scholars come in and create the Tibetan language uh, Sanskrit derivative, completely Sanskrit derivative. But he says they're never going to understand these high Indian terms. So he makes this salt, he, he wants to make it salt of the earth. So get that for a second. So you capture the essence of it, because I don't want you just to get a, a, a definition. I want you to get a felt sense. For compassion, Lord of the heart, Ningje. Ningje. It's beautiful. I want you to get, sort of get, maybe get into it a little bit. Like they're not, it's not just a definition, not just a, a thought process, but a felt process that when you, meet yourself and you bear witness to your own pain and your own suffering that it's like remember it's like this being able to sit with your own heart your own broken heart sometimes your own pained and, and, and angry heart sometimes and um, and that way the Tibetan captures it uh, beautifully it's like to bear witness to your own and another person's pain you know without trying to commandeer their pain without trying to take it over, but just to be able to sit uh, with the pain, not just of yourself and others, but the world, including maybe your own family, your own child. And what comes next in that bearing witness, uh, in this ningje, is something really beautiful. And it's, it's, it, it does not portend that there is actually something that you can do, but it's a wish. It's a wish. Um, it's a wish for myself as definition. The wish for myself in the middle of this witnessing, in the heart of the experience of suffering, in the heart of the experience of pain, the wish for myself and others not to suffer, even if there is nothing I can do. But it's a wish. If there can be action, perhaps. But at first, uh, compassion starts with, with this, just being able to bear witness um, and you'll never really, it's a, it's a very bad argument that you can do it for other people. Because the first person that it, where it becomes natural, where it becomes automatic and spontaneous compassion, that we've talked about tonight, where it becomes experiential, not just a cognition knowledge, Marvin, um, is when you're able to sit with your own pain. And um, that's key. And, and what is the difference, what we've talked about tonight, is not avoiding this, you know, and not going for a life of what? Pleasure and avoidance and escapism. You know, with drugs, alcohol, fantasy, you know, games and uh, movies and Netflix. And it's just like, 
man, I don't feel, um, I feel, sometimes I feel broken and hurt and sore. And, um, you know, to be compassionate with myself you know, is to first do like what we talked about in the first meditation course, which is, you know, to recognize what this is and to accept what this is and to investigate, to name it. You know, this is hurt. You know, I'm hurt. And, um, and to feel that pain and to be able to sit with it. And compassion starts, for sure, it starts right there. And it's our scope. You know, we talk about, uh, as a practitioner, maybe it's good for you to write down, um, the three levels of what it is that we're up to. And it's like, you know, I just want to create, as at least, um, I would like to create a future, you know, through this process of at least, if my mind goes on, you know, like that we're talking about, like these Buddhists are talking about, that at least I have a better rebirth than this one, where I can still maintain my path and practice. As my first scope is like, at the very least, maybe I can't get enlightened, you know, maybe I think like that. You know, I can't get enlightened, but at least I want that. And what is going to be, and you can write, you can guarantee this is true, for sure. What is going to make sure that happens is this quality. It's going to be compassion. You know, what is going to guarantee this, like, that this life and other lives will be better than this, than this one and, and allow me to continue on this path uh, is this quality uh, of being able to not run away from pain and to be able to sit with suffering, which starts with sitting with my own. And it's a terrible argument that you care for other people if you can't do this with yourself. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a horrible argument to make, you know, to, to anyone. I care for, I can, I, I care for others. I, I, my heart goes to others, but not toward me, you know. It's, and the, but I want you to get enlightened. But I don't see the value in it. Is is what it's like. And um, but the essence of it is karuna, yeah, ninja, yeah, to be to be with your own heart, yeah, while you suffer, and then to be. In the second scope, if we can follow through with this, then we can go further and at least I can remove as a wish that I would like to gain enlightenment. You know? I don't know if I can help others, but um, I would like to gain at least a personal awakening from suffering. And I, and I only would want that because I sit with my suffering. You can't, really, you can't want truly to get out of this until you do this, until you sit with this. So your question about what is the definition of compassion, like this is a big, it's a big question, and it has a big scope to it. And it's like, it's, if you can't sit and you can't recognize your own suffering because you're always avoiding it, you know, always medicating it and, and escaping and running away, then you can't ever face it. And you can't ever really want to get out of it in a realistic way. But I don't mean by avoidance, but get out of it in terms of enlightenment, get out of it, which is not immediate gratification. It's a really long-term process that we're talking about here of, of realization, of getting to, to truly know the wings, the, things the way that they are versus avoiding the way things are. And it all comes down to being able to sit with yourself in compassion. And at the very least, that will lead you to one thing, which is, God, may at least you know, the next time be better than this one. Or hopefully, at least this will encourage me, this pain, this suffering will encourage me to go for at least my own awakening, because I can't stand it. And then the highest scope of all, that you can sit with your own pain um, and to wish that you didn't, wish that you didn't have this, but it's there. It's this part of life. You know, it's birth, aging, sickness, death. It's everything we talk about. Losing everything. And um, then to go to the next step with that, it's like if I can sit with my own heart, my own, broken, my own brokenness, then that will allow me to sit, um, to sit with others. And it's unbearable in the same way that it's subjectively unbearable for me to sit in my own pain. Then how can I just gain enlightenment for myself? How can I even think like that when everyone I know is going through the same thing? They're all going, doing the same things, pleasure and pain, praise and blame, loss and gain, you know, fame and notoriety. And they just go round and I watch them go round and round in circles hurting themselves. And they don't want to do this thing. They may not know another way. And I know that feeling. I know that commonality. And I can't possibly, and they, you know, a friend's uh, son killed himself today. You know, and I heard about it, I'm like, or two days ago, pardon me. And, uh, and, she, and she said, any thoughts? And this is a, a student, a friend of mine, 
you know, for many years who knows these practices inside and out. And um, <coughs> it was all about this, about there's nothing, what do you say? You know, what do you say to people? I mean, uh, we had a retreat this weekend, I was going over this, and this is what I mean, you know, in vivid terms. Of, I've had, uh, and this woman died already, but she walked out of, you know, of Bergen-Belsen concentration camp, and she was in her late 70s, early 80s, and she never talked to anyone about it. Her family died. And, uh, and she's telling me, in trembling and quivering and breaking down, and um, about her experiences that she had. And to be able to sit with someone in the midst of that, uh, that shaking, you know, really the trembling of life, um, that comes from me sitting with me. And to, uh, to hold someone's hand and like not try to divert attention, not try to crack a joke or even ask more about what happened, but just to stay right there with it. That experience, and experiences like that, bearing witness to my, my own pain and someone else's pain, it makes me go to the highest scope, which is I can't stop my practice until everyone, I, I, everyone must get, must stop suffering. And I want you to get, that's what Ningje refers to, Lord of the heart. I can't do it. And uh, to sit with someone, no judgment, you know, that comes from facing me. And I want you to get a sense of when, we, when you ask a question, what is compassion? Right. To acknowledge the suffering of the world, your own suffering, the suffering of others. And there's really so much of uh, life, there's not much you can do. Truly, there's no advice to give. You can't throw money at things, even if it's your own kid. You want to, you know, you want to take over that pain. Doesn't work. You'll see one day, you'll be a parent, and it doesn't work. You have friends you'll give all the advice in the world to, it doesn't help. You'll see, mostly. Maybe on to the next round of suffering. And, you'll, and by doing these practices, you'll understand what, how to stop suffering, and not just get someone to the next place. Uh, and you'll do it yourself first. And then it'll lead you to the highest scope, which is, I can't really get it. I, I just can't get enlightened for me. I have to do this for everyone. And that's what bodhicitta is. That's what compassion is. I must get enlightened. I can't stand the suffering. My own suffering, the suffering of others, and the world is unbearable. It's uh, heartbreaking. And uh, so that's my long drawn out response to your question. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So um, let's stop there.